And off we go again. Second half remaining. And it's not going to get worse, let me tell you that. There are so many delicious tidbits left. I feel like I've been in a university class all morning. It's like a degree of sorts. I hope you're all taking notes like I am, adding words to my lingo as well. Um, just so you get a feeling for what's ahead, we're going to change themes. This is a third chapter today and emphasis on new subjects, which I'm going to tell you about right now. We call this the rewiring and rethinking of current systems. Environmental restoration and the notion of rewilding the design of data and information and the digital space. Sounds complicated to people like me, but you are in good practice understanding these terms and I'm excited to see what the next couple of hours will hold for us. Um, I'm going to remind you about the slide, though, which I've done for a couple of times today. We unfortunately haven't had much time to ask questions, but believe me, they're noted, and we will find one way or another to, to ask them uh, after this thing or, or uh, at this later event. So keep them coming. Um, I hope everyone's about to enter. I hope the soup was delicious and good. Hope I didn't oversell it. I'm sure I didn't. But what's next? I want to welcome to the stage two uh, amazing individuals. Um, the entrepreneurs Ola, Olina Olavia and Oftar Torlasius are now going to grace the stage with their presence. Give them all of your undivided attention. Thank you. Design today is not simply about making something. <coughs> it is about changing something. It is not only about design aspect anymore. It's about rewiring and rethinking every aspect of daily life. Perpetuating a system of ubiquitous non sequiturs is vital in the day's space of non-linear thinking. Who are we in the context of digital space? What is our responsibility as designers in a time of globalized conflict and nefarious systems of scrutiny? To answer these complicated questions, we decided to make the banana filter. <laughs> the banana filter transforms the user into a banana, thus changing the user's outlook on humanity itself. Am I a banana, you might ask? <laughs> no, I am not. But by using the filter, I can feel like one for a moment. Mm. <laughs> when we look into the future, the most quintessential task at hand is counteracting the emergence of capricious corporations, <laughs> thus creating a cacophony of chromosynthetic liminal spaces. <laughs> to this day, our banana filter has been used by over 14 users. Mm. <laughs> that means 14 lives have been transformed by our design. Amazing. And we've received multiple comments from one user <laughs> who said, wow, I thought for a moment that I was a banana. Thus demonstrating that our filter has changed his outlook on life. And therefore, we are proud to introduce to you the next revolution in the digital space. The, the pineapple, pineapple filter. filter. <laughs> the pineapple filter transforms the user into a pineapple, thereby solving the biggest problems we, f we face as a society. Now that's what I call design thinking. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Inspiring, to say the least. I hope you'll all download the pineapple filter 
and maybe get the banana filter up to 16, 17 users. Be ideal. Uh, the next speaker is Thor Inge Hjendal. He's the managing director of Doka Design and Architecture in Norway. Hjendal is a trained architect with continuing education in urbanism, as well as innovation and management from Haas Business School at Berkeley. For the past 15 years, Jemtal has held various management positions in private business, the public sector, and in industry organizations, as well as being the head of a startup company. In his current position at Doka, he has had a great chance to witness the development of how design thinking is being used to tackle challenges across the world and industries and the need for a different kind of capacity for the challenges ahead. It sounds like a man who's going to deliver some grand truths today. Welcome up on stage, Thor Inge Hjemdal. Ideas, ideas fail. Um, here you see the top 10, it says top 20 because the list is longer. But this is the top 10 list why startups or ideas fail. I put uh, red arrows in the front of uh, where I think design can make a difference and make sure that you don't fail. But <laughs> look at the top one, no market need. 42% of the startups or the ideas, they fail. And also, if you look down the list, you see user-unfriendly products. And that says a lot. So it's not enough to have an idea. This is from Oslo. Um, this is uh, the ticketing system uh, in Oslo. And to the left, you see the ticket kind of booth or teller. Um, they spent, hold your horses, they spent 50 million euros on this system, developing it, installing it, building it. Now they're going to tear it down. They never, they've never used it. Nobody used it. Because before they were done, the picture to the left, oh, to the right appeared, an app. They never asked the user what the user wanted, or the customer, or the inhabitants. They just developed this instead of checking with the user. This is the, the, some, like a typical design process. And number one is vital. Understand the challenge. Uh, this is what we say at Doga, uh, as you see on the bottom, if you have an idea, you've gotten too far already. So you have to understand the challenge, define the focus, but you've got to get out of your office, get out of the building, ask the, the user, do the user studies, talk to the inhabitants, talk to the customers, talk to the users, and then you have to translate these findings and sort and validate, and <coughs> then you get to the, to the idea and choose your concept. So it's a lot of work before you have this idea, and that's why so many people fail. At Doga, uh, we, have have, we have numerous kind of innovation programs. I just want to kind of explain to you that design actually works. This is a widely known uh, project example that we, uh, it's been used in the EU uh, and internationally as well. This is the reduction in waiting time for referral to diagnosis in uh, breast cancer. By using design, we were able to uh, reduce the waiting time by 90%. Um, so going to the doctor and saying, you might have cancer, and I'm waiting three months, is devastating. So we reduced it to only a couple of days using design and design methodology. But along the way, we also made some kind of new findings. Patient journey you know, the whole journey improved. Uh, the first meeting with the hospital improved, of course, uh, improved the doctoral referral and improved the uh, internal logistics. It was just one of some of the findings using design. This is Snuhata, they came to us and said that, well, we've been looking into plastic. We don't know what's gonna be. Uh, can we take part in one of your innovation programs? We said, sure, 
Um, but we were asking them, it's like, but you don't have an, any idea. No, 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 we just want to look into the potential of plastic. And then they hooked up with the uh, Nova C, which is a sea farm uh, up north. And also with this NCP, it says there, Norwegian Comfort Products, which was in the same area, making kind of full circularity. Because um, the uh, Norwegian Comfort Products, they have this extrusion um, um, machinery able to take care of the uh, fish farmer um, uh, waste products. Because um, the uh, f uh, fishing farm industry, they had 70 tons of waste, which is plastic. So design works. I'm going to talk about change as in uh, innovation today, um, a little bit about uh, the resistance, but also the difference between the complicated change and the complex, and also how you um, uh, have to look into trust and how you can change trust, and also with the needed change of power, and also how to build capacity for change. But we've got to keep in mind our brains, how they work. And it's one thing we do is exactly that, we resist change. Because our minds save energy by automatically looking into and recognizing familiar patterns, which means that if each morning when you're going to brush your te teeth, you don't uh, start figuring out um, how to do it, what to use. You know the toothbrush, you know how the toothpaste works, you do the shortcut, you just brush your teeth. So you don't rethink this every day. I argue that uh, complicated problems are kind of easy. And this is the reason, because complicated uh, problems, they could t of course, they contain a lot of uh, challenges, single parts, etc. but they're somehow connected. And they're logically, and once you move, like the picture indicates, once you move one of these wheels, the next is going to move. So the connections between them are logical and makes predictable uh, outcomes. And also how we handle this usually is more linear, uh, it's more sequential, and we organize this as a kind of traditional way of working. It's um, linear, it seems like a um, waterfall, but that's what it's called, the process, a waterfall process, which is linear. And we also organize ourselves in familiar patterns to solve these complicated issues. I would argue, argue strongly that we're looking at complex problems in the future. And the complex issues are very difficult. And you recognize them by their interconnectedness and also the number of connections and the dependability between the connections is difficult. And the illustration indicates that if you pull in one of these guys uh, on the illustration, the whole thing is going to tighten and it's going to get worse. So you have to work differently with the complex issues. And these complex problems, it's very difficult because new problems, they can kind of peep, keep popping up. You don't know when or where. I'll get back to the issues. And we need to respond kind of quickly as well. You see the pandemic. In Norway, we had to rig the financial system in terms of the businesses not going bankrupt in, you know, within three weeks. Uh, and respond this kind of quickly is very difficult. We're not rigged. Most of us, we work in silos, established silos, which is a problem, of course. And we don't talk and approach these kind of issues holistically, which is, of course, super difficult. And also, like I said at, at the bottom there, it's difficult to work human-centric and even life-centric. So the, I would argue that the traditional way of working is obsolete. But we see some shifts going on right now, which um, at least in Daga, we're embracing these um, kind of shifts going on. So we see that most businesses, they go from profit over to purpose. So they work value-based in, uh, in a different way than uh, previously. We also see that the, the hierarchy more and more is being left behind. They don't work in that way anymore. We need to work the network-based. And also uh, in terms of uh, you can't uh, control the employees, you have to empower them. Like I'm saying at Doga, I can't tell you what to do. I'm gonna, we're gonna discuss where to go and then you got to figure out what to do. So that's a different way of leading and the leadership as well. And of course, we're working, you can't plan everything. That's also left behind. You can't plan your way out of it. You have to experiment and figure out how to do it. And also, this open innovation, is, I'm going to get back to that. So I would strongly argue that we've left this closed innovation uh, behind and we're moving 
fast forward into open innovation. And this open innovation is actually something that's opening up for new possibilities. I'm going to get back to how this open innovation works. But we need to work together in collaborations. And most companies, they'd realize now, if they're going to do innovation and, and work with change, most of the knowledge is not within the, their own company. Most of the good people that's got knowledge, it's outside their own company, which means that they've got to shape, uh, form new kind of collaborations. And of course, there's some advantages with this. The um, expenses are lower in the innovation process. You distribute, distribute risk and also you make more accurate assumptions. But this is a competitive advantage, I would say, for Norway, but possibly also for Iceland. Because in Norway, it's low degree of hierarchy, making it easier to work with innovation and form these new kind of collaborations. And also, we have a high degree of trust in Norway. And that's essential to form these kind of new collaborations and also allow for innovation and ideas to flow in a different way. And also, Norway is small, like Iceland. So the distances are short, which makes it also easier to work in, in collaborative way. And we also have, as the, um, the diagram indicates, we have a huge share of SMBs, meaning small and medium businesses. And being small is an advantage because then you can sh uh, form these kind of collaborations in, in different ways. So we're moving from closed to open innovation. And this is this kind of the same, follow the, um, the green dot there, but uh, that's where the innovation um, uh, goes on. So on this one, it goes on within the company. And that's what I call close and internal innovation. We're moving over to this side. To solve these complex issues, we need to work in a different way, and we need to organize ourselves in a different way. So this is the green dot there in a big ecosystem, trying to solve these unforeseen complex issues ahead. So it's all about going from not reducing and uh, 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 only ask the quick questions and have the quick answers, but to open them up for new uh, opportunities. The simplification is left behind. You have to embrace this complexity and uh, understand this uh, in a different way, common holistic understanding. And also the chaos and the sector focus we need to leave behind. And also this fixed or locked in assumptions. Uh, we need to open this up and have transformative learning. This is uh, uh, just an example we're working with right now. We organize this as a mission. Some might have heard about it, but it's a very complex issue. And that's seriously ill child. This ill child and the family, they don't care too much how the state has organized themselves, how the municipality has organized themselves, how the hospital has organized themselves. They need help. So our way of working with this is, of course, to place this kid in the middle and then look at the whole system around and all the actors and all the problems that this uh, the kid and the family has, you know, and that's the way of working human centric. Uh, we got feedback now from the family. They never experienced this before. Uh, they feel understood, uh, taken care of, etc. But it's a huge effort for the municipality because this family before they had to approach eight to 10 different actors to get help. Right now, it's organized around them. So they have only can approach one and then it's uh, one person and uh, the, the rest is organized around them. We see that, of course, this uh, example gives challenges on uh, uh, the different levels. Of course, the user uh, and then the services and the system, but the weakest link in this whole system is the cross-sectoral cooperation. So get your shit together <laughs> and collaborate. So the value of design is, of course, that it's based on insight and me, uh, have, you make meaningful solutions, but based on insight is to, uh, to see the, uh, have the perspective from the user, from the, from the customer, from the inhabitant. Uh, you also work with multiple ideas in when you do design and design processes. You don't have just one and follow one. You have multiple, you have many ideas and they can choose um, uh, from a, a large number of ideas. And of course you work visually uh, making it enhanced um, communication, but also experimental, like it says. 
But all of this is, of course, based on deep user insight and needs. And by iterating, refining solutions, and involving the user, you have to test and improve and prototype, and of course, ensure the solution, holistic solution. So at the end, how to build kind of a capacity to work with this complexity <laughs> is super important. Do not fear chaos. Do not fear the complex. I would say embrace the complexity. Be open and transparent about it. Um, and this is probably uh, should have been on the top, but uh, agree on what the problem is. We see so many times that people start working, you know, big projects, big building projects, big projects. It's uh, uncertainty about what the problem actually is. They didn't agree upon what the problem was. So have good processes early stage in agreeing on what the problem actually was. And as you see uh, on the slide, avoid assumptions. Build trust is number three. And trust is kind of a glue in the whole system. And it creates kind of some kind of space for operating and doing different things. This one says, it's one single question. Do you have confidence in your national government? 70% <coughs> in Norway, they do. I'm sorry, Iceland is not on this. I don't know why. I didn't do the survey. <laughs> but it gives us an opportunity to work together in a different way, have different contracts, different agreements, and this trust is actually the glue, and it gives us a comp competitive advantage. Just look at the United States. Only 35% trust the national government. It's terrible. So build trust when you're gonna work. And also build a rig, and I would call it, I call it kind of an ecosystem of different actors, different competences, because you're going to face the issues are going to be different than you thought at the beginning, and they're going to be more interconnected, in, entangled, uh, and complex. So you've got to be a number of actors uh, uh, heading in the right direction, in the same direction. And also facilitate for iterative and adaptive way of reaching the goal. So the goal is not super clear, because it's going to be clear when you start working. <coughs> Almost the last advice, let go of power. Working in a non, uh, not in a hierarchy, in a traditional hierarchy, you need to trust people, but you need to empower them. So let go of the power. You'll be double uh, as resource, resourceful afterwards. But this is my single most important advice right answer to the right question. We see so many times that it's the right answer to the wrong question. And that's, uh, as it says on the bottom, if the problem is not understood, the solution might end up being the problem. Thank you. Features of young and 
Another beautiful work of art by Garðar Eyjólsson. But now on to everyone's favorite Laxness, Stefan Laxness. He's an architectural researcher and artist, formerly at the Turner Prize nominated research agency, Forensic Architecture. One of these concepts that are blowing my mind today. Investigating human rights violations. His current work focuses on the political and cultural dimension of environmental restoration as a territorial project in Europe. He co-founded Pantopia.xyz, an online educational platform for spatial thinkers. And his teaching explores the consequences and opportunities brought about by the climate crisis. So many interesting things we're about to learn. And if I'm lucky, I'll be able to grasp the concept spatial thinker. Welcome, Stefan. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a real honor to be here among such a great lineup of speakers, um, but also for the design talk team for putting together such an amazing day. Um, so my talk is broadly speaking about land and how the, the narratives and visions that we put out there on how it should be managed and transformed need to actively be questioned um, and challenged in some occasions. Um, and the way I'm going to start is by actually jumping into a, a recent project that I did that kind of led to this line of thinking. So in 2020, I started a project called Learning from the Commons, a keystone to a rewilded future. And the project was undertaken under the European Media Arts Program with the collaboration of Laboral, the Center for Industrial Design in Gijón, Spain, and funded by the EU. And for this project, I set out sort of naively uh, to explore the spatial and political and cultural dimension of rewilding in Europe using northeastern Spain as a case study. 
And just a, um, a summary, rewilding is, is a practice of environmental restoration which advocates for the reintroduction of keystone species to passively manage the land and the ecosystem. So this typically means including large herbivores or predators and minimizing human involvement, as well as also restoring certain ecosystem processes that have been uh, eradicated. Um, but the scope and ethos of rewilding as a project varies quite a lot uh, from everything from trying to establish ice age ecosystems to simply, you know, letting your garden kind of grow a little bit more wild with the help of some flowers. Um, but as a practice, uh, it's fundamentally interdisciplinary in nature. Um, and unlike traditional conservation, as to conservation, it embraces the fact that the process might lead to unpredictable and new outcomes. And while the idea of rewilding has actually been around for a while, it has been really popularized uh, in recent years by books like Feral by Georges Monbiot and Wildling by Isabella Tree uh, and promoted by groups like Rewilding Europe. To the point where it's become a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. Everything is being rewilded, you know, the church, the nature, your finances, everything. Um, and I entered this conversation actually with the image on the, the far right, which is an obscure story about how Kazakhstan was trying to reintroduce uh, tigers in the area of Ili Balkesh, which I just thought was very fascinating. I haven't really dug into it further than that. Um, so when I started I, I, this project in Spain, I, I really didn't know um, which way the project was going to go, and, and I was a bit lost, frankly. I chewed, you know, taken more than I could chew. Um, but I, I, was, I knew that I was dead set on kind of experimenting with open source environmental sensing techniques uh, as an alternative, alternative to kind of what you consider to be high tech um, proprietary tools like drones, specialized cameras, things like that. And so with that, the, the help of the great project that is Public Labs, uh, which everybody should check out if they're interested in this, um, I created my own, my own sort of homemade NDVI cameras, which stands for uh, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Um, basically cameras that are capable of inferring the rate of photosynthesis in plants. Um, and these are, which I thought was quite fascinating because these are cameras which are, are typically sort of you know, rigged to, to satellites and sent up into space to take pictures of global changes in vegetation. And so I made these humble little cameras and I rigged them to a one cubic meter balloon. And the ambition was somehow to interact with uh, and capture the processes uh, affecting areas that are somehow related to this process of environmental restoration and rewilding. Uh, and so these different sites that I would visit, but trying to capture them through a different lens. And so in the, in sort of the, the depth of the Spanish summer, um, I, I shoved the balloon in the back of a, a van and crisscrossed Galicia, Zamora, and Salamanca regions, flying my balloons and capturing um, aerial images in places affected by land ab abandonment and depopulation, capturing neglected commons, um, and also instances of a common land community going through great lengths to restore their common woodlands through environmental restoration, creating a dynamic cultural life in the process. And flying a balloon is actually, I found, is a little bit like fishing, but kind of in the sky. So you cast out your balloon into the sky and it drifts with the wind and then it gets snagged into a 15 meter oak tree. Um, and, and when you're by yourself in 37 degrees in the Spanish sun um, and you try to you know, unrig it from a, a oak tree, it's really difficult. And I really thought I was going to collapse on one of those days. Always bring a friend when you try to do things like this. And so here in this, on the screen, you see um, sort of a, a screenshot of the piece that I produced as a result of this residency program. And on the left, you have um, the NDVI imagery uh, that captured by the camera rigs. Uh, it's roughly sort of captured at 15 to 10 meters over my head. Uh, and the false color represents the rate of photosynthesis of the plants that's being determined by the rate at which infrared is being absorbed or reflected from the foliage. And the gray is the ground, which usually represents a, a, a non-value. Um, but the balloon is also capturing what you see in the video in the center, which is, um, which is um, a, actually a common land community um, and volunteers, which they've called upon, to clear a small, a small parcel uh, of the forest of invasive eucalyptus. And to the right, you have a series of photographs recording the visible traces of their restoration efforts and, an inter and interviews that I conducted with community members. 
And so while the whole NDVI thing was really fascinating, it didn't really help me much. Um, and, but the, the balloon really became an interesting device with which to navigate and negotiate with people. You know, it's sort of inviting, it has a dimension of play, but also as a, as a performative device to actually start to engage with and sort of be more fine-tuned with the, the, the terrain, the composition of what was there and, and the environmental conditions of the sites. Something that I refer to as sort of uh, near sensing as a, in opposition to the more God's eye, high-tech proprietary view that comes from remote sensing, sort of satellite images and all that. Um, and the experimentation and the, the, the exploration led to, you know, this interesting foray for me and my practice into, you know, the performative nature of the balloon and, and the act of walking. Um, but also, you know, a fairly, I think, solid sort of documentation of the social spatial practices that have to do with, you know, what happens when communities on a low budget start to restore a piece of land. Um, and in this case here that we see on the screen, it's, it was a village where 18 inhabitants um, in Galicia had taken substantial steps to transform their commons um, and to ensure the long-term environmental and economic sustainability of their woodland, restoring degraded peatlands, planting native species, and creating fire barriers. And to support this long-term process on a budget, the community had to do exactly what you see there, which is um, engage in uh, participatory action and revisit ancestral practices. And this included regularly calling upon a network of 800 volunteers um, to clear parcels of land, um, and also creating educational programs and inviting people like me, you know, strange artists, people uh, you know, with balloons, to kind of interact and, 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 uh, and, and learn also from, from what they were doing. Um, and and these, these actions also, I think I noticed, like, became really important, also moments for people, forums for people to discuss matters of concerns around rurality. Um, but also in, in what they were doing, I think it was something really important, which is that the, the act or the process of environmental restoration could be understood really as, as a, an act of resistance through process to external pressures, things like economic pressures, climate pressures, things like that. And most importantly, those processes produced design moments um, that produced not just the landscape, but also the stakeholders, the subjects. And um, so the images, the films, they were all collected and compiled into this dual projection atlas, um, a, piece, a piece which tried to just organize this sort of work and project and contextualize it to an audience, um, but also to formulate a position vis-a-vis -vis the subject of environmental restoration and rewilding. And while well, witnessing this collective action um, in, in this common land community, I came to the following conclusion that although the, the community, I think, was implementing something that could be considered sort of the proto phase of rewilding, um, the nature of their project kind of stood in strong and stark contrast to the narratives, ethos, and initiatives I encountered in pro rewilding literature. And what emerged were really two distinct spatial projects with environmental restoration at their core. The community here in Galicia embodied a participatory and inclusive spatial project driven by the desire um, to generate a dynamic social life, a mutualism with biodiversity, and to resist external environmental and extractive pressures. Meanwhile, the rewilding narrative that I encountered began to resemble an exclusionary spatial project whose implementation relied heavily on philanthropy and large-scale private land ownership. And so, Proponents of uh, rewilding seek to take, uh, this is sort of what they see as the advantage or the opportunity, uh, the largest land system changes in Europe to radically transform the continent. They outline two main opportunities. So the first one is the abandonment of unproductive agricultural land due to the intensification of agricultural practices. And the second is the depopulation of rural areas due to the lack of economic opportunities. And while there's a growing consensus that large parts of Europe need to be environmentally restored, the rewilding outlook appears, on the surface at least, to be neutral to the social and economic reasons why these areas suffer in the first place. Then the image that you see on the slide here is pulled from a pro-rewilding website. And I think it perfectly encapsulates, um, or one can interpret, at first what seems to be that neutrality, and as we'll see later, is maybe a, a more kind of insidious vision for the future. Insidious is a hard word, so I apologize. Um, the, so the image, what does it show? It shows uh, the Coa Valley, which straddles the Spanish and Portuguese border. And um, it is now a fully rewilded area. It's an area with an abundance of large herbivores, predators, and smaller species, all living in harmony. And it's a scene that's kind of reminiscent of, you know, um, of the Serengeti or you know, Jurassic Park. Life will find a way, that scene there in the end. 
Um, and in the far back, if you pay attention, you see this little relic. Uh, it's like a small village, maybe a water tower. We, we're not, it's not really clear. Um, and it's sort of, I don't know, the way I interpret it is kind of the evidence of past human inhabitation. But more importantly, in the center of the, of the image, uh, there's this very little detail, which is uh, a tourist temporarily visiting and experiences, experiencing this new, newly rewilded and big outdoors in this little tent. And, but if you actually go to, you know, what, what, this, what this image doesn't actually uh, portray is uh, that the area is actually completely different in reality. It's a, the Duoro River is a dammed hydroelectric, ele hydroelectric power station. So it's an energy landscape. It's a network of roads. Um, it has cables, it has villages. It's connected. There, there are people. Uh, there are businesses. Um, and so the area might be depopulated and the agricultural land in the process of abandonment. Um, but uh, it is fundamentally an inhabited and working landscape. And human inhabitation in, the in, the, in this depiction of rewilding, um, it stays sort of outside of the frame of that vision. And instead, it frames this new land occupied by new subjects. And through, I think, uh, through, so through the literature and site visits that I, I ended up doing, I found that rewilding branded initiatives were either kind of remained sanctuarized, often a, crit a criticism of traditional conservation, privatized or had exclusionary qualities like lack of transport, rural gentrification, exorbitant house prices or tolls. Um, on the slide here, you see Britain's largest rewilding initiative, or one of them anyway, called the, the Studland and Heartland Moor. And uh, what's interesting about it is that, you know, it, it is actually cut off in that ferry crossing area. They could have built a bridge, but they didn't, um, to Bournemouth, which is a large metropolitan area where people could actually easily access and enjoy this site. The rewilding area also seems to host the, the largest onshore oil field in Western Europe, which is an interesting thing to have in the middle of a rewilding area. Um, and, it, and the, if you wanted to live in the area, all the mansions seem to cost two million pounds. So needless to say, wanting to engage and interact with it um, becomes inevitably kind of touristic or, or uh, an, an act of privilege. And if, as you can see, I, I read The Guardian. Um, but I, if you, I, following kind of the, the story of rewilding, I've been kind of charting different stories about it. And um, in recent news articles, anyway, in the UK, there's clearly a narrative that emerges that kind of large UK landowners will pioneer rewilding for the greater good. There's this heroic pose here that you see by this baron who owns thousands of acres of land. And we are expecting the royal family to take on this great task. Um, the, the, the NEPA state uh, with Isabella Tree, who actually wrote the book uh, Wildling, is another example. Here you have sort of the image of you know, the landed aristocrat taking on this progressive project. Um, and on the, on the right, you have a bit of a tangent of a story, but they're actually in a conflict with uh, developers uh, who are building housing right next to their, their rewilded uh, initiative. Uh, and it's blocking a future ecosystem corridor. And what's interesting about the story is really it's an instance in which uh, two crises are playing out and coming into conflict in rural areas. The first is the ecological crisis, and the second is the housing crisis. But in both, both cases, the projects uh, involved are actually, you know, they're not necessarily being pushed by, you know, an interesting progressive committee of institutions and people who are making necessarily good decisions, but they are being pushed by essentially those that probably stand to, or have, you know, stand to gain the most from sort of uh, these processes of accumulating land and accumulating capital through housing. And then it goes a step further. In the book um, titled Rewilding, um, The Radical New Science of Ecological Recovery, uh, the authors introduce the readers to the ethics uh, and science of rewilding, which is fascinating and really exciting. But when it comes to discussing references to precedents and to optimal management models, they almost exclusively draw from private and philanthropic ventures, which embrace essentially the privatization of land and wildlife. At no point is there really um, any talk about any other type of vision for how land should be managed. And it's important to point out that the book itself is co-authored by members of Rewilding Europe Supervisory Board. And Rewilding Europe is uh, really the most visible and vocal proponent for the project of rewilding in, um, in Europe. Um, and it boasts pretty strong sort of governmental and, co and corporate partnerships. And as we all know, you know, um, you know they, well, 
first of all, they, they often cite strategies that, inscribes, that are inscribed in the logic of uh, market capitalism without seeking to challenge them. And as we know, you know, when you get to uh, you know, sort of um, carbon offsetting and, and rabid afforestation, that actually can lead to more environmental problems um, than we had in the first place. And particularly striking is their enthusiasm for the South African model, in which following the fall of apartheid regime, small and profitable farms were consolidated into private game reserves, and wildlife itself became private property. And I think you know, mentioning that and being enthusiastic about that as a project should be maybe an object of concern. And I think there is a lot of stake, actually, because today uh, there's almost a quarter of EU citizens, four out of five EU citizens that live in urban areas. Um, and it's estimated that by 2030, there's going to be 200,000 square kilometers of land, agricultural land, at high risk of abandonment, which is an area roughly the size of, of Romania. So it's a lot of land. Um, <clears throat> and it's sort of well documented at this point that um, the presence of people practicing a plurality of practices leads to often a better stewardship of our, of our environment and ecosystem. And <clears throat> as a member of the community of Hoshan uh, sort of puts it really clearly, um, rural depopulation serves the land and its resources on a silver plate to extractivism, be it mines, wind farms, or industrial forward plantations like eucalyptus. The less people there are in an area, the less structured, the more impoverished, and older local communities are, the better it is for business. In conclusion, inhabitation and local autonomy are key to a diverse, dynamic rural condition. Here you have pictures of what a collective action looks like and how it becomes really a forum for sharing not just food and drinks, but also ideas and concerns. And um, when, um, the, when influential and vocal groups outline and advocate for a vision of the future, we should, I think, pay attention to it. When the discussion around environmental restoration seems to be driven by, um, by groups uh, and large-scale uh, large land, or, sorry, large-scale uh, owners and individuals and institutions, um, we should also seek to promote other voices. Um, and while private initiatives might seem, um, while, while a private uh, sort of initiative might seem similar on the surface, they in fact produce a, an entirely uh, different reality and and social spatial relations afterwards, often replicating um, and uh, sort of replicating existing uh, power dynamics. Um, and the the um, sort of to, I mean the act of rewilding itself is not problematic, but it ha but it becomes so uh, when it is not challenged and the condition and the sort of the condition of capitalist accumulation which it inscribes itself is not being challenged. Um, again, just like, I guess, the message of sustainability has kind of been firmly co-opted and greenwashed, the narrative of who restores and how it will be done and who, it, who is represented, most importantly, in the process is also in the process of being appropriated. Um, so I think there's an urgent need to complement, but also to resist the visions of uh, some of these groups. Um, and in the context of growing inequality, a continued reliance on market solutions to tackle the climate crisis and the consolidation of lands into pri large private estates, you know, one has to ask the question about whether their ambitions can reproduce processes of spatial inequality um, and, and give cover to, to essentially new forms of extractivism and enclosures. And you know, one should ask also as citizens, you know, are we destined to then become transient visitors like that person in the tent or like all the other tourists that I could found in the rest of the series of those photographs in privatized environments? And so in a sense, more should be done, I think at this point, um, to learn from the plurality of small community-led initiatives and more should also be done to strengthen them and to bridge the gap between them and the sort of policy and institutional sphere. And that somewhere between you know, the intensification of the city, the intensification of agriculture, there's a geographic space in which to learn from these places and uh, to, to identify new environmental com commons in which there's both a need and an opportunity to experiment. A condition in which alternative um, forms of governance, action, and environmental restoration are mobilized to overcome uh, what are often historic processes of marginalization and degradation. And this is something I've been exploring uh, with my students at the Architectural Association for the last three years. How can we describe and identify new environmental commons in which to propose positive projects of territorial transformation and advocate for institutional adjustment in the process? So not just think about how things look, but also how they operate, and most importantly, how they are governed. 
Um, I'm not going to explain what they are because I feel like I'm running out of time. But they're, you can check them out on pantopia.xyz. Um, and finally, it also asked the question as to, you know, how can the architectural proposal become a vehicle to uh, not just, you know, work through these problems, but to connect and, and, and present these complex territorial processes into sort of polemicized projects. And I'd like to use my last minute uh, just to plug something that I've been working on. Um, so uh, this summer, I'll be co-teaching with uh, Os Oskar Arnarsson here in Reykjavik, a summer program called A Visiting a School Iceland, Fish, Football, a Political Ecology. Um, and um, it's a two-week course, intensive course, where we'll explore the link between resource extraction and cultural institutions in Iceland. And it's part of the Architectural Association's Global Visiting School program and held in partnership with Lista Hauskole and uh, Kex Hostel, who has kindly offered to host us. Um, and beyond looking at the relationship between industrial fishing and football, the course is really an experimentation in you know, collecting evidence from the field, transforming and processing it, and polemicizing it in new forms. And the course, while it's an architecture course, is really open to anybody who feels mildly creative and mildly spatial at every level. Uh, and we have significant discounts for local students and local participants, as well as scholarships. And on that note, thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. Very strong lecture, and hopefully made us all think, like other lectures today. Uh, and now onto something completely new. I'm introducing two new individuals up on the stage. They're actors, performers, artists, really, dear friends, creative minds such as yourselves, uh, members of the acting stand-up group Canary. Uh, let me welcome. Steine and Guðmundur Felixson up on stage. So the organizers asked us to uh, yeah, move your blood a little bit. Uh, so we're going to do a tiny little exercise yeah, with you. Yeah, just a tiny little, don't yeah. worry. They asked for just a tiny, tiny little workout. So that's what we're going to do. So everybody, stand up. Yes. Stand up. Uh, and we're going to start by just like uh, moving our hands. Yeah. Uh, and we're just going to do it a tiny bit, because yeah. that's what they asked for. So yeah. we're just going to uh, lift our hands up. And down. You're doing great. Wow. Very good. Up. And down. Amazing. Wow. Ooh. I feel the sweat coming. <laughs> yeah. And up. And down. Wow. wow such a great well job. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's. We know how we're it not is. finished. We're not finished. Yeah, no, 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 no. You have to stand up. Okay. Next up, we're going to do some, na some knee pants. Knee pants. Knee pants. So, like you can see, it's when we bent our knees. So, everybody. Just a tiny one. They just asked for a tiny little workout, yeah. so we're just going to do a tiny bend. Just a tiny little and bit. Everybody together and bend. <laughs> and up. And bend down. Not too much. You're doing too much. Too You're much. doing too much. Yeah. And up. And one more time. Up, down, and hold, hold it. it. Hold it. Hold it. I can hold feel it, it burning oh my. Oh my god. Wow, okay, and wow, well done. done. I think we need to take it down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's just move our shoulders, no, our, what is it called, our neck a little our bit. Neck, yeah. Just a tiny bit. You can barely see me moving my head. <laughs> this is really good exercise for designers, because you're always on your phone. Or your computer. And now the, oh, wow, the so relaxing. Yeah. Yes, you can feel the blood flow to the shoulders. Yeah, I can feel it. And the other circle? Oh, <laughs> I was already doing that. Oh. oh, wow, so good. We're going to uh, end with one exercise, yeah. and that's a very important yeah, one. Yeah, the grand finale. Are you ready for the grand finale, everybody? Uh, it's good if everybody finds something to hold yeah. on to. It's the tiny little twerk. We're all going to do a tiny little twerk. So we're going to just put our tiny little butts out. And just do a tiny, tiny little twerk. Tiny little twerk. Not too much. It's just twerking my tiny little butt. Tiny little 
twerk. Oh, one more time, one more twerk. I hope you're all doing it as well. <laughs> Amazing! You've been great, good. designers! Thank you! Have fun today! Just a tiny little twerk. Catchy. All right. Refreshing as well. And on to another refreshing event. We're going to learn about the universal thirst which is a type foundry that specializes in fonts for Indian and Latin writing systems, founded by Gunnar Vilhjálmsson and Kalapi Kajar. The foundry has collaborated with brands including the Freeze Art Fair, Monotype, and most recently Google. The foundry's mission is to expand the design possibilities for India's various writing systems. Universal Thirst's work is a part of a huge advance in the representation of Indian writing systems, driven by the global spread of the internet and smartphones. And Gunnar and Kalapi will be joining a conversation with Marcus after their lecture. Let's welcome them on stage. Thank you. Okay, it's good that you're uh, all warmed up. <laughs> because we, we're going to have more fun now talking about fonts. <laughs> uh, I met Kalabi 12 years ago at the University of Reading in, in the UK, uh, where we were both studying type design. And uh, in 2016, uh, after working uh, in London for rival uh, type foundries for almost half a decade, Kalabi and I, we joined hands and we started the Universal Thirst. And, uh, Universal Thirst is a, a typeface design um, practice, and uh, it's based uh, primarily in, in Bangalore in India and here in, in Reykjavik. And uh, <clears throat> since we started in uh, 2016, we need this one. <laughs> uh, the studio has slowly grown, and today we have uh, an amazing team of, of 12 people uh, working remotely from different locations in India and in Europe. And in Europe. Um, the team, as a collective, specializes in several different languages and writing systems for the uh, Indian subcontinent. And uh, together we work on these uh, complex multi-script uh, typeface uh, projects for brands uh, from around the world. So this is India. Uh, Post-independence, India was divided on linguistic lines. Um, as you can see, all of these uh, states here, uh, several provinces. Um, I'm from the Western Indian state of Gujarat. Uh, and in my um, mother tongue of Gujarati, there is a saying that every 10 uh, villages, uh, the language, the clothing, and the food changes. Um, and next slide. Um, and uh, true to that saying, the subcontinent is home uh, to at least 68 writing systems and more than 780 languages. Um, and while um, letter vernacular lettering kind of continues to represent the epitome of India uh, in uh, the typography sphere, um, the representation of written languages in functional text environments like you know, your mobile phones or on the web or even in print media uh, has been subpar ever since we transitioned away from manual typesetting techniques uh, in the late 80s. Uh, scripts, from the subcontinent, uh, scripts from the subcontinent are fundamentally different in their orthography. Uh, as compared to the Latin script, the Latin script is kind of linear. Uh, most of uh, the scripts from the subcontinent are kind of nonlinear, very complex. They have vowels kind of on top, before, above, after, uh, and have much larger character sets uh, compared to the Latin system as well. They also require a lot more specialized uh, training or skills from the typeface designer because it requires a lot more engineering to get a font file working correctly for all of these complex scripts. Yeah, and this, this problem is actually similar to uh, uh, what Icelanders know from uh, kind of the old days with computers. When we were trying to 
key in our names with Icelandic letter forms. So basically, F, Thorn, and all these accented characters. So my name is Gunnar Thor. I would get uh, an FL in instead of Thor. So I would be Gunnar Flor. <laughs> uh, and imagine, I mean, these are just like a, a couple of, of letter forms for us. But in India, this was like all the writing systems. They were excluded from, from, from these platforms. Yeah. Um, and the cheap uh, introduction of cheap smartphones in the subcontinent has really changed the status quo for uh, you know, the tech companies of the West. Um, suddenly supporting this really large group of individuals from you know, traditionally underrepresented uh, parts of the world is kind of becoming a business uh, move. Um, and it all started at Google under a program known as uh, the Next Billion Users. And the Next Billion Users are essentially non-speaking, non-English speaking users that have access to all of these social media uh, apps and, uh, well, cheap smartphones and apps like Facebook and Instagram, uh, but they are all English only. Uh, the function, one of the functional ways to kind of bring this large group of individuals or kind of enable them to use these uh, systems better and kind of collaborate better uh, is fonts. Okay, so <laughs> uh, the Swiss artist Luca Cinarti, he, <coughs> he created this emotional creature <laughs> under the influence of our uh, psychedelic typeface, Eli. And the word is uh, Araga, and it means beauty in Tamil. So he's shedding tears of beauty. <laughs> and Tamil is the language spoken by 75 million people, mainly in the southern Indian state of, of Tamil Nadu but also by a large diaspora around the world. I'm gonna get some water, wait. <laughs> Can you give me a glass of water? Well, the Tamil script is kind of traditionally monolinear. You can see the forms are kind of, they look like ballpoint pen markings. Uh, the manuscripts are uh, created on dried palm leaves, uh, which are very brittle. So the resulting letter forms are kind of round. You will never see a very kind of strong straight line because that cracks the palm leaf. Um, and once the, uh, and you use kind of a sharp metal stylus to kind of carve into the palm leaf. And once the carving is done, you take black soot from a lamp, like an old oil, oil lamp, like fill it in. And that's kind of brings the letters, uh, you know, contrast to the palm leaves. <clears throat> so, Tamil was first translated to typographic shapes under colonialism. And uh, uh, when they did that, they were used in the, using it uh, along with these uh, Latin typefaces that had this like a modern style that had like Scots, Roman, and Bodoni. And they had uh, a really high contrast, like a, a big difference between the thickness and, and, and the thin, thin strokes. And uh, this became kind of the convention in, in all the South Indian type design after that. And uh, this type is that we were showing now, uh, Eli, it actually gives a nod to this monolinearity, this historical monolinearity. However, the designer Eli of Eli, uh, Anaga, she was inspired by the 60s psychedelia and uh, she wanted uh, the letter forms to morph and transform, and uh, as a result, she, she made these like a nine different versions of it that can merge between bottom heavy to monolinear and all the way to, to top heavy. And it has this a variable psychedelic axis, basically, <laughs> that you can animate through. Yeah, and this, is, this typeface is Sarvatric. Sarvatric basically means universal, and it's kind of our uh, house typeface. Uh, we intend uh, for the typeface uh, to support, uh, to eventually support all of the scripts of the subcontinent. Um, and it's, as you can see, a very neutral kind of all-purpose typeface that hopefully graphic designers can use 
in complex multi-script uh, you know, environments uh, while kind of making everything look uh, homogenous. Uh, currently, Sarvatrik supports uh, Bangla, Devnagri, Gurmukhi, and Latin. Uh, and it also includes a wide range of weights. Um, and our, our kind of philosophy behind script harmonization is to kind of maintain the history um, and the kind of proportions of the original letter forms while trying to um, match uh, the overall texture and the feeling of the typeface rather than kind of force one script's individualistic shapes on another script. It, they're kind of one kind of idiosyncratic members of one large family, so to speak. Um, and with this, the Latin script supports 4.9 billion users. Uh, with Devnagri, Bangla, Gurmukhi, 600, 330 million users, we bring another almost a billion users into the, uh, into kind of the conversation. Uh, and then in early 2020, uh, Fraser Margaret Studio designed this identity for the Dhaka Art Summit uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, Fraser had already designed a typeface uh, for the Latin script, uh, for the English part of the identity, uh, but, the, but had the idea to kind of create uh, a Bangla companion uh, because it's in Bangladesh and uh, Bengali is kind of the national language in the script. Uh, the let Latin letter forms are desi designed to kind of represent seismic ac activity, and that's why they're kind of broken and shaken uh, and kind of introduce distortion. Uh, and he approached us to draw just a handful of letters um, in the beginning to match the title of the event, as well as some uh, important dates. Uh, but we soon, after working on it over two or three weeks, we soon realized that this deserved its own font. Um, and within a matter of weeks, it had over a thousand glyphs and we were kind of adding more to it um, as we went ahead. Um, the single design, uh, the single uh, design was kind of just a single weight design. Mm -hmm. uh, we included, we in, which included multiple glyphs and kind of the, what you see here, the kind of smooth transition wasn't possible then because it was all part of the same family. So we kind of separated them on kind of a seismic or a distortion axis. So it goes from being completely normal to kind of haywire uh, to kind of represent that, um, yeah, that idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you all, uh, you've seen this one here today. So this is one of our typefaces as well. <clears throat> and we've been working on this quasi mono spaced typeface now for uh, on and off for five years, and uh, uh, it's thanks to, uh, yeah, it's actually uh, our uh, friends and collaborators, Studio Studio, who did the identity for uh, design models and design talks, and they kind of brought in the typeface as well. And this is the only place it's, it's been uh, used uh, um, from the beginning in, the, in, in these five years. And since we started working on it, we've been expanding it as well. And now we have uh, a Devanagari for this typeface as well, along with um, uh, six, six new weights, basically. And uh, we've always felt that this typeface is, uh, belongs to this kind of a sci-fi uh, visual realm. And uh, so when we started looking for a name, we kind of looked into this, this realm and, and kind of looked, yeah, to the skies, I, I, I guess. And uh, in 2014, uh, there was this interesting interstellar object.
Uh, yeah, so what I was saying is that um, this interstellar object entered our solar system in 2014. And uh, uh, it came really close to Earth uh, around 2017, uh, close enough to be discovered by Hawaiian astronomers. And uh, these astronomers, they, they named uh, this object Oumuamua. And uh, uh, with all these kind of stories around this object um, and this kind of mythical, I guess, aura around it, we kind of decided that our typeface would have to take this name, uh, Oma. <laughs> We're just and, big fans of space. Yeah, <laughs> big fans of space, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, there have been these speculations about this object as well. Um, that it was actually an alien spaceship. And this is not <laughs> just like uh, something from me and Kalapi, but there was an Harvard professor that actually said this in, a, in an article. And uh, when you're reading these, these science articles um, about things like this that come from space, you always have like uh, some kind of an illustration that is an artist impression, right? So this is an object that has never been photographed. And, uh, and for some reason, these scientists, and this artist is probably, I hope he's not in the room, <laughs> <laughs> but he's probably like uh, trying to render this like uh, as kind of uh, objectively as possible. And you often get stuff like this. So this is the, the main image that, that you would see with these science articles. And uh, it's basically, it's, it's as un interesting as, as it could possibly be. If you think about all these like a beautiful ideas and, and the story, how it kind of ignites the imagination, this would not be something that I would draw at least <laughs> like a, So we wanted to do our own version of this and after talking to our friends again, Studio Studio, they actually suggested that we would commission this amazing artist, uh, Raf Rafael Garnier, to reimagine Oumuamua uh, with us. And this is basically <laughs> what, <laughs> what he came up with. And the beauty is that like, uh, this is now the kind of the signature image that we're using to promote Uma. And we always do these like uh, visual worlds for all the typefaces that are kind of based on the idea we have behind the designs. And I think this is kind of a nice way to use your imagination. So we've approached our visual identity in a similar way. We love telling stories, um, and we decided that our logo is going to try to spark more conversation. Um, so our logo is a lion and a polar bear, kind of representing the two contrasting environments of Iceland and India. Um, we got this idea on a trip that we took uh, to the southern Indian town of Kunur. And as soon as we had the idea, we kind of went to this sign painter, Joshua, who told us that he had never seen a polar bear before. <laughs> so he called up his friend who had a smartphone and asked him to help him with an image. Uh, who said, like, you know, again, the smartphone thing. He sent him the image and he, this is what he created. Uh, which is really kind of cool. Uh, and our second commission uh, was uh, to British illustrator and artist uh, Sophie Hollington, who drew a lot of uh, visual references uh, from alchemical history and kind of the history surrounding heraldry and um, coats of arms uh, around the world. And this is kind of what we are currently using um, as, our, as our logo. Uh, and it's very, I like to keep putting this image uh, in the <laughs> presentation. It's kind of this tongue-in-cheek attempt to take a picture of uh, two founders kind of agreeing to start something together. Um, and this was taken kind of long before all of the typefaces and the identity that we now have. Uh, but our t teammate Suna on the other day uh, kind of remarked that this looked like the lion and the polar bear. <laughs> uh, and it, it kind of represents that really well, so we decided to kind of share it here. Feels really serendipitous. 
This one here is a, a type specimen, so it's like a type specimen book with uh, examples of different typefaces, and it's from 1937 uh, from a type foundry in Chennai in India. And uh, it's up here because uh, we found our name in this uh, uh, specimen. And the owner of, of the, the foundry, he has an introductory text there where he is actually expressing uh, a universal thirst for new typefaces for the manuscripts of India. So we found this really like uh, much relevant still in 2016 when we, when we started the foundry. Yeah. Uh, and books and other uh, uh, printed material kind of have always played a very important part uh, in our practice. Uh, in addition to kind of creating and distributing typefaces, we are also interested in typographic histories, or alternative typographic histories of regions uh, where there isn't a lot of material available. Um, there's usually, any, any material that's usually published on the subject uh, is, all, is kind of in Western libraries or Western archives, making it very difficult for local design students to kind of access and kind of learn about their own history. So as a way to change this, we've kind of uh, made our collections public um, as part of uh, the Universal Thirst Gazette, uh, which is going to be kind of a, a collection of uh, stories of objects uh, and by people. Um, we're also publishing interviews with kind of designers uh, who've been working in this realm for a very long time, uh, like this one with Professor Mahendra Patel. Uh, Professor Patel was the first Indian to actually study typeface design uh, in Europe, first uh, at the Basel School under Armin Hoffman. And then later, uh, he apprenticed with Adrian Frutiger in Paris. Um, and uh, Frutiger kind of exchanged uh, Professor Patel's knowledge of the Devanagari alphabet, uh, or he exchanged, uh, he made, uh, he kind of made this deal with him in exchange for Frutiger making pasta, while uh, <laughs> Professor Patel lived with him in Paris. And those are some of the preparatory sketches for Univer Devanagari, which, is nev which has not been published. Uh, but yeah, he's, this is him working on... Uh, yeah, I think we're way out of time. Yeah. So I'll try to speak fast here. So <clears throat> as, as the world becomes more connected than ever before, uh, so the need, the need for uh, uh, previously uh, ignored communities to voice their uh, opinion, their story, uh, in the language, with the writing system, uh, it becomes increasingly important. And uh, one of the functional components of making this a reality is by making uh, more typefaces available, actually. And uh, typefaces that, that offer a wide range of, of typographic expression uh, while recognizing the value of their respective visual histories. And this is kind of what we are, we are working on at, at Universal Thirst. And uh, in uh, 2020, uh, we were going to have an event here at Design Mart where we we're going to open like a font library and a new website. And uh, of course, nothing really worked out in 2020. So we ended up like uh, having to postpone it. And uh, uh, we, we are actually quite uh, happy to announce that we've managed to get out our library of fonts from today. And uh, now you can all, after this lecture, go home and buy some typefaces. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank having so us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gunnar and Kalapi. And next, we'll be hearing from Georgia Lupi. She's an information designer and a partner at Pentagram. Advocating for data humanism, Lupi's work synthesizes data and storytelling in an innovative way to create unique and singular brand expressions. In her practice, she designs engaging data-driven visual narratives across print, digital, and environmental media that create new insight and appreciation of people, ideas, and organizations. 
and she'll be joining Gunnar Kalapi's talk uh, after her lecture. Let's welcome her on stage. everyone. Just see if it works. Should work. Hello. Hi. I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, this has been really incredible up until now, so it's really, really great. Thanks to the organizers for making it happen in person. Uh, my name is Georgia. Uh, it's my first time in, in Iceland, even though I'm European, so it's a long overdue. I'm Italian originally, but I've been living in New York for the past 10 years. Um, and so I titled this talk, Making with Data. And what I hope is that in the time we have together, I can make you look at the intersection between data and design in an appealing way, and to make you start seeing data as a material, like typography, words, and images to tell all kinds of stories. And also maybe through this lens, perhaps to start thinking about data in general in a, in a, in a different way, but you know, let's see. Uh, but let me stay, uh, take a step back. I define myself as an information designer, so I work with data every day. And that means that every day with my team, I shape and design the different ways that my clients and their clients access all kind of information, and particularly in my case, data. So data that can be quantitative or qualitative, data that organizations already have, or all, actually the most of the time we help crafting with my team and in collaboration with our clients, and data that we then represent visually, translating these numbers into images through data visualizations and through building interactive experiences with these visualizations. Uh, I'm a partner at Pentagram, which is an independent design agency made of 23 partner. I joined three years ago in their New York office. And Pentagram, the company that I joined, is traditionally known for brand identity design, so logo, word marks, but also packaging, editorial design, book design, exhibition. Maybe you recognize some of these logos and previews that have been designed by my partners even long before I joined. And what I introduce with my team is data as one of the tools, the materials that we have to even express a brand story or a story in the physical space where images are not only graphic compositions but the patterns, the colors, the sizes of what make these images is always the direct representation of a data point and therefore like a vessel of information with keys and legends for people to be able to understand and to dig in. But for me, before even being a design tool, personally, data is my way of seeing the world. It's a lens, a filter that I use to make sense of reality, one subject at a time. And it's really the way that I see the world. It's a way of living. And through my life, I've, data, I've used data um, as my way to understand and to see better so many times, even beyond the professional developments. I've used data, for example, to understand what was going on with my physical body in moments where my health was uncertain. What you're seeing here are the screenshots from a huge spreadsheet that I used to keep a couple of years ago where I would track and log different undiagnosed symptoms that I was having. Um, and here you can see the many categories that I've tracked for over one year, mixing actual physical symptoms with contextual details about what was happening Happening. And it really has a way for me to just see potential correlations and to keep me sane in, in a moment of uncertainty. And you can also see that everything is not only a yes or no or a scale of one to 10. It's really filled with notes, with observation. It's my form of journaling. Um, and it looks pretty obsessive, I know, but some doctors <laughs> that I have met appreciated this. Some other, of course, instead gave me the, the look of like, this person's really crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so even in other non-tough moments of my personal life, I've used data as a form of journaling, like where I've started dating after a breakup from a 10 year long relationship. <laughs> well, I really felt the urge to track and understand through this lens what was going on, my expectations, how I reacted to different people, what I didn't like in the whole process, and it was really clarifying to me. Um, but then again, professionally, since I graduated college, uh, data has always been my favorite design tool. And I've used it for at least, at this point, 15 years to discover stories, create understanding, connection, and ultimately making artifacts. But I did not invent it. There is a long history of representing data to measure, to record and understand the world in a profound way in all cultures, from the Mesopotamian clay tokens to count and combine and organize information, to all sort of instruments to measure time and how we spend time, to physical instruments that facilitated the development of science to tracking and recording information. 
but it feels to me that the more the data are increasingly part of our everyday life, like nowadays, the more we get distant to their very nature, which is primarily human, which is documenting our lives, our imperfect life and experiences. So today, I would like to get back to what a handcrafted approach to data can teach us about all kind of data, even big data set and digital data sets. And I, I thought that instead of going in deep, um, in depth in one or two projects, I'll try to show you many of them, highlighting different aspects aspects of what, to me, make data the most compelling material that we have if we think about it in the right way. So um, let's, start, let's get started. Um, at the beginning of my career, I used to work a lot with newspapers, and I still do. And in this case, working with newsrooms, the ask has always been for me to, to me to create a data visualization that can tell a rich story, not a simplified one, like, a, like an, an article could do. So a little different than what you'd think about if you think about a chart. And one of the very first formative projects we've worked on at Accurate, which was a company that I was the director at and co-founded before joining Pentagram, was a two-year-long collaboration with the Sunday Cultural Supplement of Corriere della Sera, which is the main Italian newspaper. And so these that you're about to see are probably not the visualizations you would expect in a main or national newspaper. So every year for this project, we looked for data into, on a main topic from different sources, from Wikipedia to physical encyclopedias to the very few open data websites that were available at the moment, combining and overlaying different information on cultural and social phenomena with many layers of context that every week we would visualize with a unique language created and crafted specifically for the data stories that we found, as you can see from this preview, always with a legend, a key for the reader to dig into this non-linear storytelling, if you will. So here are the colors, the position in the size of the elements, the type of elements, is the direct representation of a quantity or a qualitative aspect, so everything represents data. And the column was really popular. Reader loved to spend time solving a puzzle or crosswords, even on the beach, like, like learning new thing. And it was very funny, but also formative for me. Every Sunday, I was still living in Italy to spot readers anywhere and see how they digged into the pieces, how they would talk to the people close by to what they discovered. And at the time, at Accurate, in my company, nobody could code, so we were all just designers. So everything that you see here was done manually, spending hours on Excel, like spreadsheet, and then manually positioning elements on Adobe Illustrator. So if you can use any kind of design software, you can really do it. It's, it's painful. <laughs> uh, it, for example, this is a rich visualization about Nobel, Nobel Prizes and laureates over the years, their ages, the university affiliation, their degree level, and so on, with the legend on top. But I don't want to get into details. What I really want to say is that in the beginning of my work life with data, the impossibility to have shortcuts in the process, so the limitations given by the fact that nobody could code, like really having to plot data manually, taught me the importance of customizations, of designing, of designing visual models that could represent the uniqueness of the story that you have at hand, as opposed to relying on a tool where you upload your data and you get a fancy out-of-the-box chart. Um, and I actually have always had and still start with sketching. After analyzing the data and having the data and the quantity in my head, sketching is really my way to make sense of the story, to build the architecture of the visualization. It's the way I really get to know my data, I, I do believe. Um, I do still work with newspapers, even though more, a little more rarely these days, and more and more what I'm trying to do in this context is crafting stories through data where people can perhaps see themselves in there, can relate to something through data. Uh, we are used to seeing cold and aggregated charts of newspapers, on main newspapers, and when I'm given the opportunity, I'm trying to do the opposite. Um, so here's another recent example. The New York Times asked me at the end of 2020, the first year of the pandemic, in case you don't remember, to design a cover for their at home section that was actually popular in 2020, of course. And they told me to come up with a visualization that could make sense of the first year of lockdown through data. There were so many data at the time out there that they were sure that I could, you know, create like some trends or presentation or anything that could help us understand. Um, but I've decided to look at my own 2020 instead, but not to tell a story about me, instead to hopefully make 
space for people to see themselves too, to punctuate a blurred timeline that all of us shared. So I went back and looked at my calendar for the year, and as I was looking at it, it struck me how perhaps all of us could recall the last time we took the subway, the last time we sat at our counter, the last time we saw our dear friend before lockdown. But then, like over time, we likely, many of us have all of our first time around calendars, the first hang on a stoop of a friend, the first socially distant walk with a friend, the first outdoor dining, the first haircut. And so this is what I did, very simple, a simple, very, a simple vertical timeline of my 2020 organized horizontally into categories. So all the time I saw close friends, the time I saw family, the last time, you know, for example, I saw my mother in Italy, all the time I saw my partners in Team Pentagra, all my New York life and my self-care. And all the white dots are individual events on my calendar. They were on my calendar before. I mean, I log a lot of the things that I do, so I really have my life on my calendar. Uh, but then in red, I marked and annotated all the one that actually happened to be the last. So you see a cluster in February and March, uh, followed by a very empty time of virtual life. And then you start to see a series of blue dots that are my first. Um, and I saw this project as an opportunity to make a space for people to relate, or at least to encourage readers to think about their own months and year under lockdown in a new way. Um, I do think that data can give us the chance to make space for people to fill in with their own stories if it's done right, because it is an abstraction of the world that hopefully then somebody can fill in with their own context. And uh, still talking about journalistic story then, uh, this is a personal project that I did with a friend um, and their response to me taught me a lot about how can we also make people feel something through data. Um, uh, her name is Kaki Keen, she's a very talented musician, close friend of mine, and unfortunately the project started with an unfortunate situation when her three years old daughter Cooper was diagnosed with a condition called ITP, which is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks her platelets and then leads to spontaneous bruises, burst blood vessels called petechiae all over her skin, and in the most terrifying cases even internal bleeding. And so Kaki wanted a way to make sense of this experience and together we turned into data. So for four months we collected and combined quantitative data from her daughter test and qualitative observation from Kaki, so data from her life, her home level of stress, the main episode that happened. But so not just clinical data, but really a daily observation of a mix of quantitative and qualitative information that then I started to analyze. And we decided to share this personal story, she decided to share this personal story, but not with words, but through this data, then I visualized in a way that you probably wouldn't normally expect from a medical data, because these information are very intimate and very intense, and so I asked myself, can a data visualization also evoke empathy and activate us, people, also at an emotional level and not only at a cognitive one? I needed to be able to translate this data not into cold facts, but into an artifact that people could feel. Um, so without entering into details, this is the final artwork of the visualization where every white petal is one day for the four months of the data collection, paced and spaced according to the most important moments. So for example, when Cooper was admitted to the hospital, the clusters are spaced uh, having those moments in mind because for them it wasn't a linear timeline, it was much more of this paced one. And every day on the panel, I visualized the intensity of the bruises that Kaki was observing with that brush that could resemble that. So the more the, the purple splotches um, are present, the more intense the bruising was. And the petechia, so the little pink dots and how spread they were, which are here, the pink dots. Uh, the platelet counts from her uh, Cooper's test are the burst of red dots, balancing out the moments when uh, she was admitted to the hospital. There was also been positive moments in their life with this yellow uh, highlights um, uh, that, I, um, that I highlighted. And then the feathers that you see, the lines that you see outside are the uh, khaki's own fears and hope detected on a scale from one to 10 um, every day. And that was done really manually on an iPad. So again, once more, really, uh, I was really feeling her as I, um, as I crafted this visualization. And so all around then we added Kaki's personal notes for the day and what's interesting is that this visual and the data collection was also used from Kaki to create a piece of music that she composed directly from the fourth month of data collection as a cathartic art for her as she kept saying where the timeline of the song represent what was happening in their life exactly as the visualization and I will play part of the song uh, for you to see and hear.
so I will not play the whole song for the sake of time. Everything is on my website and on the Pentagram website with the legend. But this artwork moved so many people that saw this visualization as, as a warm space in a way to learn about the story of Kaki and Cooper through data, feeling part of their life, probably more than reading a blog post if you think about it, about the story. And we didn't use words here. We used an handcrafted representation of what we saw in the data stories and feelings. Um, again, seeing this more and more a data visualization as a space is a space for people to understand and empathize. Um, after the last project, Bruises, uh, you know, what the, what the last project, Bruises, taught me is also the importance of the data that we don't see. So the data that are not already in form of a spreadsheet, but they are the ones that usually tell the most profound stories. And right after this project, I've taken an, an approach inspired by Bruises with this mural uh, that I was commissioned for the Museum of Modern Art um, that was closing a show called Item, Is Fashion Modern? Uh, there was a show about fashion and the culture around fashion. So the show displayed on a whole floor at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, 111 items of clothing and accessories that have influenced our society and our culture, from the bikini to the burkini, from the Dr. Martins to the Levi's 501, the little black dress, the pearl necklace. And at the start, I didn't have any data. I only had the list of these 111 items of clothing and accessories that were in the show and the uh, research that the curators have made on that, so a, pi a pile of paper. Um, so I put on the glasses of the data collector and I went and asked myself uh, a few qualitative and quantitative questions to create a data set of. Coming up with categories about why was each item included in the show, their cultural reverence, how they made us feel about ourselves, what the messages that their carries are. Were the data were absolutely not in this form um, before this analog process. So again, building a data set, crafting a data set that could reflect the most important aspects that the curator of the show wanted to highlight, such as, for example, is the specific item a medium or a message? Meaning, is it included in the show for its technical and aesthetical features or for what it represented? Furthermore, is the specific stereotype exhibited in the show the result of a spontaneous and organic evolution in a specific culture, or is a specific product marketed by a brand that became popular, and many more, creating my categories out of like really unstructured follow of information. And then I depicted every single item according to this new attribute on a big wall, where the colors and the rotation and the positioning of the elements represent these differences and categorizations that we created, where again, there was a legend on the left side that could help make data uh, readable in a way. And having the chance to show stories with data in a physical space when people can physically engage with it, I think is an incredible opportunity. This is an even more physical example. It's a series of interactive installation on a new exhibition space in the center of Chicago, owned by the University of Chicago on the theme of behavioral science, so the science of how we make decisions where visitors can create their own data inputs while being part of an ongoing anonymous data collection for the researchers, researchers at the University of Chicago who study how we make choices. And so in this space, you're actually playing with data physically, the categories and the sizes, understanding how your answer can change a collective picture through visual patterns. And even if you don't understand what data is, you can engage in a meaningful way and hopefully walk away with some knowledge. Um, what's interesting is that initially we thought to create digital interactive installations, uh, so screens and iPads, but because of budget constraints, actually, we needed to go very analog, which I believe has proven to be successful. So this tactile and active way of interacting with data, I think made it really accessible. Um, and well, obviously when you can actually make objects and, and things that people can carry around, I think it's even more fun and possibly educate educational. Um, and what I think it's interesting with product design made with data is the possibility to reach a far wider audience that wasn't interested in data per se in the first place, but might start thinking about data um, in a different way. And this is an example of it. It's a data-driven collection that I designed for the brand and other stories, uh, where the graphic patterns um, are printed and represent data points, they're embroidered and sawed, all representing stories. It was probably the most fun projects I've worked on. 
Um, and instead of making just hopefully beautiful pattern, the goal here was to design fabric that, uh, again, not only looked great, but carried meaning. And each garment visualized data about three female pioneers uh, and their accomplishment, which was something really important to another story. So in that moment, the mission of the brand was to tell the inspiring and aspirational stories about women to younger women. Um, again, I won't go into the details of the visualization. Today for me is to show how the approach of the stories and the craft and the possibilities we have. But these are the final pieces for the first of the three women, Ada Lovelace. She was the first computer programmer. And, and the pieces visualize the algorithm that, as a matter of fact, originated the discipline of computer science. And also it is the base of pretty much all of the devices that we carry around. Uh, here are some of the sketches and sort of like, like manalog, um, manalog, <laughs> manual and analog uh, analysis of the data set um, and some ideas on how to place them on clothes. And this is Rachel Carson's part of the collection. She was the first environmental activist and her book called Silent Spring, published in 1962, is the classic that really launched the environmental movement. And the pattern is the visualization of the structure and the main themes of the book, evolving with the book's progression. And here's some of the backstage. And you start seeing the visual inspiration here for Rachel is for, for more organic, uh, nature-driven uh, themes in a way, as opposed to Ada when I got inspired by by geometric, mathematical even ideas. So trying to match the content and the subject with the way that I visualize the data. And again, talking about handmade here for Rachel, I literally build my data set out of a manual analysis of the book, which I know very well right now. Uh, these other three are the final pieces for Mae Jemison. She is still like the first African-American woman astronaut. Where here the patterns represent the orbits of her mission around Earth in 1992 and the experiment she performed. Um, so visually inspired by the orbits and the space. And what's interesting about this client's way of working with me is that as part of all the pictures taken for the publicity, a beautiful model was posing uh, wearing the garments as I recreated the legend behind her. So to really invite customers to see all these garments as story-driven patterns. So nothing about the communication was hinting that those are just random patterns. And finally, when customers bought any of the garments in the store, they got a paper bag that I designed containing the pattern and the legend. So how to interpret what's in the texture, which is always a crucial point of my work. And I really know that probably not everybody will nerd out dissecting adults' algorithm from here, but at least they really know that what they're wearing has a deep meaning. Um, and again, the reason I'm interested in these less conventional or perhaps more popular projects is that you might enter a store and think you wanna buy a pretty dress, not thinking about data at all, but maybe then we got you intrigued. Um, so I'm trying to experiment more in this space. I recently worked with an incredible company, Hugh J, who has been making cement tiles and objects using the traditional hydraulic method since 1933. They're based in Mallorca and what they do is gorgeous. And for them, we've made a special collection of handmade tiles. It will be out in the summer, so this is a, a sneak peek somehow. Um, and we needed to design tiles. And obviously, with my team, we looked into data. We discovered that Frederick Chopin, the famous composer, composed his most famous 24 preludes in Mallorca, where he was there in exile, and the company is based in Mallorca. Um, so we decided to analyze and dissect the preludes and compose a system of modular tiles representing each one of the preludes. And these are the actual 24 tiles. Um, it's a photo of the first batch they made. So one after the other, from top left to right bottom, each tile represent a prelude and the details of the actual pieces it's they're really incredible it's one of the projects I'm really excited to see uh, done soon uh, and we analyze the preludes manually using keys, tempos, the way that they've been categorized uh, in terms of tones by music critiques, the runtime, the range of notes in the keyboard, the voices and design the pattern that represent them again one prelude being one tile. Um, and this is really making with data, following their whole process has been really mesmerizing and they gave us a lot of constraints uh, that were made by how the mold needed to be shaped that influenced our design, which I think is always a good thing. Um, 
So there's that. Uh, but in just a micro pause, so you've seen a lot of analog projects of different kinds. Most of my clients are actually big foundation, big companies. We design and develop digital experiences and applications all the time. I do work with a team of developers on, on bigger projects. But today, I wanted to focus on these more tangible type of projects because these approaches really have been driving my whole way of working with data, even when designing digital applications. Um, there's this aspect of crafting the stories, crafting an experience for the readers and user, and I do apply the same principle uh, to all kinds of projects with data. Uh, and so this is the last section of projects. I have three more quickly getting into the actual making from a personal designer and artist's hands in a way. A few years ago, I embarked in the most painstakingly laborious project that also is the project that taught me the more about the world of data. It's called Dear Data, where from one year I used personal data collection as a way to share my life with somebody I didn't know before. Another data visualization designer named Stephanie Pozovic who lives in London. And for Dear Data, every week and for one year, we used our personal data to get to know each other. Our personal data run weekly shared mundane topics from our thoughts and ideas to our most intimate feelings from our belongings to our apologies and laughters. So personal data that we would then manually hand drawn on a postcard size sheet of paper that every week was sent from London to New York where I live and from New York to London when she leaves for one entire year. So we have 52 and 52 of them. The front was always the data drawing, and the back of the poster contains, of course, the address of the other person and the legend, how to read our drawings, how to understand what was going on in the week. <laughs> yeah, no, this was really laborious. Um, every poster was unique, and in our daily data collection, we didn't only quantify the number of time we performed a certain action, the number of time we did a certain things. For example, in this example, complaints, not only quantifying the number of complaints, instead adding a lot of context about why, what was happening, was it necessary, what was that about, what was the situation and the feeling, could have I avoided it? Ultimately making this data tell the other person something intimate about ourselves through this lens of data. Really so, realizing week after week how to put ourselves in those numbers and realizing the importance of adding qualitative aspects to make this data truly representative of ourselves. Creating, if you think about it, intimate portraits of ourselves to share with the other person through this invisible layer of data. So Dear Data got actually pretty viral unexpectedly and the original collection of postcards have found the most exciting home because it has been acquired as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which has been quite nice. But what excites us even more is that Dear Data has been so well received from the public outside the data community. We've seen thousands of postcards and artifacts made by people, not even designers or artists who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves and even teachers of any grade are using this format to teach their students the world of data. So this kind of like warm, accessible way of looking at data um, and represented data, I really think can be a starting point for all kind of conversation. It's a way of expressing yourself as well. And following this aspect, this next, one, this next one is a commission I got for one of my favorite brands in the world, Moleskin. Uh, so Dream Commission, I've been asked by them to use one or more of their notebooks as a material to reflect on the topic of time and then donate back, and I could do whatever I wanted with the notebook, and then donate back the notebook back to support the mission of the foundation in education and to inspire new people. And I decided to use the notebook to reflect on my life so far. I turned 40 last year and I felt it was a good moment to really look back. So I disassembled three whole Moleskine notebooks uh, and then reassembled their pages into this accordion. Then I counted and divided up all the pages into 14,496 uh, points, days, little tallies for each day of my life so far on the planet that I first punched like two holes for each one and then I individually stitched with a wide, almost imperceptible thread and obviously I have, I have no idea, I had no idea what I signed up for it when I got excited about this concept. I was stitching pretty much everywhere in my spare time, evenings and weekends for many months talking about labor. Um, and then on top of the white stitches, I uh, marked the days, uh, on top of the white stitches that marked the days, I made second stitches using color thread to mark important moments for me. So stitching the data set of my life so far. Moments that I either just remembered or that were, were logged in some other data collections <laughs> from my first words, my first love, from important achievements to health care, losses in my family to moving, travels and changes. Um, and here are some of the pages. 
And again, the, fi the final result is a visual archive of my memory, crazy laborious, but very meditative, and I think intimate. And I really also think that more than a definitive, definitive point of view on my life, it's a way to start a conversation about it, I think. So what's the right point there? What happened? How, to, how do you remember it? A starting of a conversation, which I think all data are in the end. Uh, and here's the last project I want to show you today. I'm still on time, uh, which is also one of the last one we've launched. It's a collaboration with my partner, who's an artist as well, Erin Chaudet, who's in the room somewhere. Um, so we called it Incroci in Italian, that in English means crossing, crossing lines. It's an art commission from the Merz Foundation, Fondazione Merz in Italy, and you see here how it looks for afar. And what you're seeing is the charting of significant moments in the lives of 99 people, strangers. So a graph of intersecting line, creating a, one kind of a data portrait for each individual. So in fact, a few months ago, we asked strangers to share five dates in their lives that they saw as significant, the most significant moments so far through a easy Google form that we just posted on Instagram. And these five dates were just required to start with the day they were born. So you're birth date and finish with the date during the past two years since the start of the pandemic. And the other three dates in between could have been anything. And we didn't even ask participants to share what the date was, um, even if actually many left comments to explain that instead. And we hope to get at least 50 participants responding. And over the course of 24 hours, we got 1,400. So over 1,000 people that wanted to share those moments with us. And so here are how the data set are represented on each individual canvas. One black line represents one date. Uh, every canvas is for a different person, connecting the day from 1 to 31 along the left vertical side with the month on the horizontal side and the year on the right vertical side. And every person obviously have a different timeline, so the year part is divided according to the time span from a person's birthday to the present, somehow normal normalizing everybody's lengths of life. Uh, forming these crossovers is encroaching, painting these visual homages to a life. And what I also find interesting in this project is the back and forth between analog and digital. So as part of the project, we, pro we process, we plotted every single individual to see all these lines together and to test our initial framework. But then we actually painted them all manually, each one on a big canvas. And actually Aaron did most of the job here, it's really all him. Uh, and in his heart, it doesn't work with data in the way that I see it, but he work really, his work runs around themes of labor and value of this labor in our evolving society. So it's, it's some how uh, speaks to the same themes. And what I found fascinating hearing him talk about how painting this line of life is really that one by one, he felt so much a connection with these strangers that he was representing. And it also felt like a cathartic process that we hope the viewers will see too. So if you think about it, this scene in parallels, these timelines, identical sometimes, very different some other times, we think offer an opportunity to reflect on this collective and personal hallmark of memory in a way, and hoping that the viewer will start an intimate and personal dialogue with these strangers, and actually perhaps start to think about their own lives too. Obviously there's a little legend on the wall that you can carry with you uh, as you walk by the paintings and all the names of the people who are displayed here are at the bottom of this paper. So it was a great opportunity. Uh, and for this show, which is, up, which is up in Palermo until September, we only showed 99, but it encroaches on evolving work um, and we hope to keep it make um, travel the work. So, all right, I think you've seen what excites me, I believe, about the crafting aspect of working with data, crafting the stories, crafting the data itself and the experience. And what the making with data keeps teaching me is the human aspect of data, which I think is the most important even when we work with big data sets and big clients. And this last slide that you see here is a visual manifesto of what I call data humanism, a manifesto that I've made and that still guide my work, uh, where we see data for what they are, which are actually representation of our imperfect and different lives. And I do hope that more and more, even in this hyper-digital era, we will start to see data as very human uh, and really treat them accordingly. So thank you. I hope that everyone now is eager to start designing with data. <laughs> Thanks. Amazing, Georgia. Thank you. Come, Am I staying here? Yeah, come and sit down. Come and sit down. Well, would you like to go to the, the dining room or no, the lounge? No, I like the kissing thing. <laughs> and um, Kalapi and Gunnar, why don't you come and join us as well? And I'll try and find some connections between what you all do, but that's not going to be that easy. But um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, Georgia, um, 
there's, there's, so much, there's so much data in your work, but if you were to look at your work, you wouldn't necessarily know what that data is. Does it matter? Could I look at the, the tiles and not give, not give a damn about Chopin? Would you be happy? Uh, I think I would. I really know that very few things are necessary for everybody. So again, I don't think that everybody would dissect any single aspect of you know, the data points that are in the work. And this morning, um, you guys talked a lot about how, in any case, aesthetics and a, a beautiful visual look are important to make people feel a connection with an artifact. So I think that I'm really aware, and it's very OK, that uh, m m the work that I do can be either seen as, oh, that's you know, a beautiful pattern, or wow, there's so much that I want to learn about it. I always make this example that I think that sometimes my work can be seen both from a Bart Simpson of the world and a Lisa Simpson of the world. <laughs> world and appreciate it in both ways. So as in like Bart would be like, oh, that's a pretty image, great. And with the same one, maybe Lisa Simpson would like to get to know all the details. So I, th I think it is okay. And I, I guess one way of bringing together what both, both of you do is it, at the core of it's about sort of conveying information. Um, what, are, what are your priorities when it comes to conveying information? You mentioned about the artistry of it. So there's, there's, there's the data, or if it's, if it's a, a script, a, a font, it's the, what does it say? But then on top of that, you can layer curlicues and colors and things like that. So starting mm. with you, Georgia, I mean, how do you strike that balance between conveying the vital information, uh, telling people what it is, and... Um, adding artistry and how do you stop yeah. the artistry getting in the way of the conveyance of information? Sure, it's a really interesting question. Uh, well, I mean, as you see, my work always comes with a legend, so if you want to, you'll be able to really get all of the information that I wanted to convey. In terms of the spectrum between being very artistic in a way and more functional, it really does depend on the goal of the project, what the audience can you know, take in at the moment, the way that they have to engage. I always also say that if I had to design a dashboard for a pilot to land a plane, I will probably would not ask him to read a legend. I'll do red <laughs> and green and that's it, right? So I think, you know, there's, there's, but there's a full well, spectrum. Well, the pilot might be going, oh, this is so <laughs> beautiful. Whoa. Exactly. No, we don't want that. Uh, but I really do think that as I was looking to your talk, guys, um, well, ultimately we are facilitators, translators, like we're creating languages that people can express stories through. So I do think that data can really be a language and maybe that uh, translates a bit into what you guys do. Yeah, so let's put, hear from Kalapi and Gunnar now. So same question to you really, how do you balance yeah, the... Yeah, I think so, uh, like in our field, we have this kind of a nice categorization of like a, a two directions to take when you're designing a typeface. We have a display typeface uh, where you're doing like a, a typeface for headlines that can be more like a decorative and, and more like a, where you have like a more artistic exploration because uh, there you can kind of go to the, uh, like a full spectrum, like the end of the spectrum of legibility. But the, on the other end, we have text typefaces. And, and when you're reading a text, you don't want to see the typeface, right? And there you kind of, you have less exploration but you're just thinking about getting the con con, uh, communication through. So you have the spectrum of this kind of familiar, fam familiarity with the shapes that you always have to kind of think about. So for us, we, we kind of, uh, we already have a category to work into where we know before we enter how much artistic kind of exploration we, we have and how much, how much part communication kind of has to, has to, has to play. Yeah, another aspect of this, uh, to add on to what Gunnar said, is for uh, scripts from the subcontinent, um, and this also applies to scripts from Southeast Asia and other underserved kind of regions of the world, is that the range of expression, because typefaces kind of are used for ex some kind of an expression. Either they can be Helvetica and like say everything or nothing, or kind of have kind of a very intrinsic um, uh, um, statement to make. Um, with availability for fonts in um, uh, four languages of the subcontinent, there aren't a lot. So for Gujarati, which is my uh, mother tongue, there are about seven typefaces to choose from, you know, compared to the Latin script where you have 300,000. So um, the, for us, uh, as you, you know, as you looked at our typefaces, they kind of they kind of juggle between the extreme and absurd 
and kind of very uh, straightforward and uh, practical. And what we want to do is try, try to kind of address that chasm. Um, so we want to kind of create typefaces that are very expressive. Uh, so a person who wants to create expressive typography or expressive uh, visual design can use those. Uh, while if somebody wanted to kind of have some pragmatic, uh, very, very kind of user friendly uh, design language, then they can use more of the uh, traditional fonts. And when you're trying to communicate information, of course, the, one of the important things is that people can read, you know, ladies or gentlemen. You don't want to make right. read the wrong one the wrong way. But um, if you, in Gujarati, you said there are seven different scripts that for, the, for, for Gujarati. Does the, does the way it's presented, does the artistry or the shape of the letters, does it have convey more information than just the word? Do people who are more familiar with this version of Gujarati, yes. are they more funny, are they funnier because the, the script has got kind of spiky bits on it, or are they angrier because it's more square? Does, does the, the letter form convey mood as well as information? Yeah, so uh, the idea of expression has been uh, explored quite a bit in vernacular <coughs> typography, like things like sign, signboard painting, because that was one of the only ways where, um, peop because the technology has never existed to typeset these languages, there was only the manual medium. So you will see a very rich history of vernacular type. So you can go to kind of eat street food and there'll be like this gorgeous type that is inviting you into the restaurant. Makes you hungry. Yeah, makes you hungry. And then you will have like, th there are types that look or mimic clothing and then that is kind of, you know that's a textile store. So there is that expression at a visual level uh, but we, but it's not been translated into kind of functional typography that everybody can use. It's kind of this. It's kind of. It's always been kind of the, um, uh, the domain of the sign painter. Like there's this artistry uh, surrounding it. And same question to you, Georgia, because some of your work is done on a computer and it's very orthogonal, uh, and some of it is very artistic and non-linear. And then particularly the thing you did with Khaki King, it sort of, it it doesn't follow a conventional. Um, beginning and end, it goes all over the place. That does, was was that um, done for any particular reason, and does therefore the way that the information is processed and absorbed by the the viewer change? Yeah, um, I, what I try to do is always try to represent the content and the stories that I find in data into how I make decisions about the forms and the colors and whether it is more organic um, or, or less organic. And I think the way that, this is kind of like really gestalt perception, the way that a person perceives any kind of image is like first of all by spatial, comp spatial composition and so the positioning of elements on a, a piece of paper or a screen is the first thing that we read, and so a hierarchy of information. So therefore, you know, if you see things that evolve over time on a line, you kind of like already assume that there's a chronology. If you th see things straight, you know, you perceive the one things it after another. If you see things grouped, that's the first architecture of the visualization. And then we start to perceive colors and quantities and sizes and shapes. And so that's the second thing that your eye will go into. And what I try to do is kind of like layer hierarchies of information according to what can be a main story that people can find. And and then maybe then lose themselves in a non-linear way looking for, say, the yellow spots because they want to follow that particular story or just like reading one thing after another. I really think that visualizing data is a form of non-linear storytelling as opposed to just an article that you read from the beginning to an end. But there needs to be anchor point. So there needs to be a, a first anchor point where a reader, a visitor, or a user can start to understand how to dig in. And then it's up to them. Mm. I thought it was funny how you showed your spreadsheets and then you showed the work that came from the spreadsheet. It, it, to, to my eyes, the spreadsheets were kind of ugly and incomprehensible, but you, could you have turned the spreadsheet into the, the final piece? Did you then have to hmm. extract, why did you have to extract the data and then make that into some kind of poetic Well, I see, thing? I think it is because our eyes do not, so I could have turned a spreadsheet just into a, a, a data visualization, maybe like color code in the categories, but there's so much that if you just build it linear, the way that a spreadsheet is done, 
your eyes cannot perceive. As you start to overlap some of the categories and quantities for one element, then you start to see and compose patterns. And I think the power of visualizing data, again, according to the grouping and assigning symbols and colors and other layers of symbols is the ability to help your brain see things at the same time, which I think is spreadsheet for the way that it is organized and kind of like or disassembled in a way uh, cannot. So I think to me it's always about finding a way, trying to find a way to represent the things that I, I see in the data sets. And I feel that in any case, every data set has a point of view if, because even if you don't visualize it, the way that you've collected it or the way that a sensor collected it is dictated by what a human wanted to collect. So, you know, that, then there's the step forward, I think, from a designer or an artist to see, okay, how do I want to uh, help people see this story? And not sense. to put too much pressure on what you do, but information designers have to interpret data for humans because psych psychologists have proven that humans are terrible at, at getting statistical information, <laughs> aren't they? Because yeah, we, we, you know, we, we evolved on the, in the savanna and it was like, oh, lion. It was yeah. a kind of very easy thing to understand. But if you're talking about the probability of risky of catching COVID, for example, <laughs> like, it's really hard for us to, to get that. So that one of your key jobs is to try and reveal the story behind the, the, the dry numbers. I mean, yes, I think that we are fundamentally visual human beings and we do understand when we see things. Uh, and our job, the job of information designer is perhaps to just really bridge that gap and link it. I do think again that beauty and the fact that something might look unfamiliar but interesting can be a, an interesting like trigger point for people to then want to know more as opposed to seeing a, a page of equations and probability and statistics. It doesn't really feel a lot of appealing. So I think design has the power perhaps to make even data appealing. Namdguna and Kalapi, one of you is from the Indian subcontinent, one of you is from Europe. Um, I know that in, in, in Asia, there are different conventions, I'm not sure about in India, but you know, uh, some people start the writing on the, the right and go upwards, and, and some um, follow the Western convention, top, left, right, and down. How, how does that, how, how have you, what experience have you had of looking at what each other's culture, the way that you represent information, what kind of conf confusion and misunderstanding does that, does that trigger? And um, what, what have you learned from looking at people who write things in a different, a whole different direction even? <laughs> well, misunderstanding, uh, nothing like uh, significant yet. <laughs> but, uh, no, but you talked about some of the fonts being non-linear, so what do yeah, you yeah, mean by, I, I, by that? Yeah, Maybe exactly, explore yeah. what so that it's, means. It's, uh, definitely, it's a different system. And, and, uh, and uh, actually, it's been uh, quite a steep learning curve for me because uh, I didn't have any knowledge of, for example, Taiwan Akari before, uh, before I, I, I went to, into type design. So it's been, of course, uh, I've been trying to figure out ways in, in like uh, on how to learn all these different scripts. And in our foundry now, we have like a team of people that have like a different knowledge on of the different scripts. So it's actually impossible for anyone to kind of, uh, well, there are some people of course, <laughs> but to know all the different scripts on their own, right? It'd be some kind of a, like a, master specialist in, in, in all of this. Okay. But, uh, well, We're going to have to finish up now. I would love to have explored that more, the difference in the way that information is consumed and understood for, in different cultures, but we'll have to save that one for the, the bar later on. Thank you, okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We go next. We'll hear from Susanne Vos. She's a digital fashion designer at the digital fashion house, The Fabricant. Questioning what and why we wear something has always been a center question in her conceptual design. The Fabricant is a digital only fashion couture house, leading the fashion industry towards a new sector of digital only clothing. The umpteenth time my mind has been blown with new concepts. Tonight, digital only clothing. Imagine. 
The fabricant aims to show the world that clothing does not need to be physical to exist. The fabricant collaborates with global brands and retailers to help them deep dive into its unlimited possibilities. And in her talk, Susanne will engage in conversation with Moshe Lundström, fashion director, stylist and contributor to Vogue. This is something to look forward to. I welcome them on stage. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, my name is Moshe Lundstrom, and I'm so pleased to be here with Suzanne Vos. This is her first time in Iceland. I'm often here, and this is such a wonderful opportunity to have a conversation that is really at the forefront of not just fashion, which is a passion that we both share, but also the future. And Suzanne's work really embodies that. She is visiting us from her headquarters and design studio of The Fabricant in Amsterdam. Just to give you a little brief, and then I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne to really describe what The Fabricant does. They were founded in 2018 as the world's first digital-only fashion house. And it's a decentralized studio which creates digital fashion and non-fungible tokens, which you can co-design yourself. I want to hear more about that. That's very interesting. <laughs> Trade and also wear. So the Fabricant is recognized as a global pioneer in the space. They've been covered by multiple publications, including Vogue. They recently raised $14 million. I just read in a new investment round with people That's like right. Ashton Kutcher investing in this future of fashion proposition. And they're really creative and innovative to the core and committed to burning down the industry's traditional toxic status quo, which we've been hearing a lot about today, to rebuild a more democratic, sustainable, and equitable fashion system that operates purely in the digital realm. So it's my pleasure to welcome Suzanne, who is a digital fashion designer and project lead, to educate and inspire us all to really start thinking about building our wardrobes for the metaverse. So Suzanne, I'd love if you could take us through the fabricant's concept, team, and business model. Be because behind this digital company, there are real people. Yes, thank you, Moshe, for the introduction. Um, so the Fabricant is not just a company or a brand. It's really uh, an ecosystem where we try to build this entire system to immerse brands, fashion designers, to become part of a movement where we go in towards a digital-only fashion industry. Because how the fashion industry is operating nowadays, it's just not possible anymore to go, uh, to go like that, you know? Like, we already have enough clothing for a wardrobe for the upcoming 50 years. So why should we still keep creating physical things if we can go towards a digital-only fashion industry? And tell me a bit about how big is the Fabricant's team and where are they located? Because I think I understand that over 50% of the employees of the Fabricant actually work remotely. Yes, that's right. We are located uh, all over the world. We have colleagues in Mexico. We have colleagues in Canada, all over Europe, Portugal, Italy, uh, Tunisia, uh, Russia. We're located everywhere. Uh, which makes it a very global and diverse team. Uh, in 2018, it was founded by Kerry Murphy and Amber. They started with the two of them. And now in 2022, um, we are with a team of 60 people. So we have grown very fast. Um, and it's like a combination of high-skilled fashion design, 3D craftsmanship, and bus new business models uh, that's focusing on blockchain technology. And the Fabricant has such clientele as Puma mm -hmm. and Adidas, Off-White, Tommy Hilfiger, but also there's an opportunity for the average person to become a client in a similar way that you might, you know, a fashion house or a couture house. Can you explain to me how we might create our own digital fashion or really co-create it? Because I think that's part of the reason why people have been so interested in the work of the fabricant, because there is that sense of 
ownership, even if it is transcending the physical form. Exactly. We want to immerse the community uh, within the creating process because we came, became so detached from how our clothes were made or who made them. So the Fabricant has its Fabricant Studio. Uh, we also have at the moment a project online if you're interested um, where you can see the interface. But basically what the Fabricant Studio offers are like the, like the, the models, the fashion designs. <clears throat> And then with that, we collaborate with international uh, textile designers. Um, so if you go through the interface as a creator, uh, because we see the people who go through this uh, interface as the creator, um, they choose a mesh. You can basically see it here in the video. You choose a mesh. You choose a textile. You can name your uh, design. And then you can uh, mint it on the blockchain. And you can start collecting it. You can trade it, um, you can create your own fashion shows with it, you can um, create your own uh, stores. Uh, so you can really start to build this like fashion imperium for yourself in the metaverse. Speaking of, when we first met, mm -hmm. I was in Miami, you were in Amsterdam, we met over Zoom and you were wearing some beautiful jewelry wearables, yes. um, which is just one application of how you might wear some of the work of the fabricant. What are some others that you've been seeing clients, how, they've, how they're incorporating these pieces into their lives in yeah. interesting and innovative ways? Yeah. So there are different um, use cases. Of course, you, you see like the transition of people wearing um, their NFTs as profile pictures. Like uh, nowadays, you see a lot of times people are not um, communicating their identity anymore just with a picture of themselves, but um, yeah, with this NFT, with this metaphor from the, the, a different identity um, of themselves on the, on the internet. Uh, then we have like game implementation uh, where people can use it in things like sandbox or um, other games, like we are also building this in uh, Unreal, which allows us to uh, implement it in several games. People do uh, the AR dressing, of course, where you can immediately interact with a fashion uh, item, as well photo dressing, uh, or wear it on your avatar as an as a art piece, basically. That's so interesting. Like maybe someday we'll see the fabricant dressing somebody who attends the Met Ball, as we saw the other day, right? That could yeah. that could happen in the future. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like exactly. That, that that is what you. Um, we actually did like the Meta Gala, so we have an own form of the Met Gala <laughs> in the Web3 space called the Meta Gala, and we dressed uh, Ruby Gloom, who is a um, a digital influencer. She's basically a pioneer in the space um, where she endless express herself in several ways with her identity. And um, she's based in Hong Kong. And what we find so interesting was like, we really see her as the empress of the metaverse. So that's also how we wanted to dress her during this meta gala. Um, so what we basically did was um, taking like traditional um, uh, Chinese references with more European references and then creating this new aesthetic, but taking a look into the past to create something for the future. And you made me think, because like in a traditional couture house, there's quite a system that's followed for the very high-end clientele that might be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for, let's say, a Chanel jacket where they decide to order the item, and then there's multiple fittings that go into it, and then they receive it mm -hmm. months down the line. What is the process like when someone is co-creating a piece of digital couture with the fabricant? What is that fit process and that back and forth co-design process like? Yeah, so digital fashion doesn't fit you. It follows you in a way, but of course, um, the patterns itself can be created uh, on demand, like on real measurements. The thing is like to go towards this digital space because we only use uh, yeah, digital uh, place of creation. So all the processes from beginning to end are digitally. 
but you need to know the rules to break them, right? So mm -hmm. it's very important for us to know these processes, how they went traditionally, um, and then create them, um, how they went physically and then creating them digitally. So also how you see in this video, uh, this was uh, a jacket from the Zeals Museum, which is a traditional uh, Dutch jacket. And next to it, you see a traditional fabric. Um, so on the video, you basically see how that fabric was digitally interpreted, wow. uh, how it needs to have this look of the stitches, of that feel, um, and then translated this craftsmanship, what was there in the past, to translate that to digital. This is so interesting, and I'm sure there's people here in the audience that might be interested in exploring working in this space, working in these fields, being a, a digital designer. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to this work? Yeah, of course, yeah. I, I would love to um, get more people into, in towards digital fashion because it's the future. Uh, I myself have a background in tailoring and fashion design. Um, when I saw in my second year the true cost, I was totally shocked by the fashion industry. And for a moment, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to be part of such industry that is the second most polluting industry of the world. But then I also realized that you can only change the system if you're a part of that system. So not long after that, I was during the Dutch Design Awards, uh, or during the Dutch Design Weeks, I saw the fabricant. And I was so amazed by, uh, by, by the deep collection which, which was presented. Um, and I just remember myself sitting a long time in front of that screen watching the video of that. And it evoked an emotion, the same emotion I got from fashion. And I also understood it was not um, just a concept or a project, but it felt like a mission and I wanted to be part of that mission. But yeah, I was very physically educated, so what I did was just basically go on YouTube and watch a lot of tutorials. Like there's a lot of out there, there's a big community that's always out uh, to, to help each other and it's really helping each other towards this industry. So also the Fabricant has, for example, a Discord channel where you can just join for free, get into and get in touch with me or the other designers and other people from the community. Yeah, I'm sure Iceland is breeding a lot of talent in this space too, because mm -hmm. there's just always such an emphasis here and in this market on sustainability and on innovation. I just wanna remind everyone too that we are going to be opening the floor up to some questions at the end, which you can also submit online for Suzanne. So if you wanted to do that while we're chatting, feel free, I don't think it's rude at all, because um, it's such an interesting topic. I also wanted to ask you about what are some of the more innovative and exciting projects that the fabricant is working on now? And then let's look into the future a little bit. Yes. So what I am currently working on, because the fabricant is not just one thing. We have an academy, we have the studio, we have our community. So I'm working uh, myself in the label and the label is about exciting other fashion designers, other fashion brands to excite the industry to excite them to also start their own fashion label. So first we were working, like last year we were working in projects that like were projects all the time, right? So we were exploring different platforms, dropping a uh, project and then it was done. So now we want to work more towards a long-term vision, like what does a fashion label mean in a digital space? How does it operate? Who do we need to be a team together. So that's very exciting. Uh, we also have an ex exhibition in Next Museum in the Netherlands, uh, soon with AR uh, implementation, as well a drop on, a, on the studio, which you can co-create the items that we are working on right now. And how do some of the more traditional fashion houses that work with the fabricant incorporate the technology? What are some of the initiatives that they're taking to explore increasing their digital footprint and perhaps decreasing their, their physical one? Yeah, so mainly fashion brands, 
were first hesitating a lot. It was first more mm. an extra, uh, a cool thing, nice to, to, to have, but not necessary, right? But then COVID happened, of course, and then the productions couldn't happen. So all of a sudden, uh, it became a necessity to produce digitally because physically it was not possible anymore. So what we have seen and what we have done for the last years and also during COVID was educating these brands to um, digitize their processes. So normally how a design process goes, most of the time, I'm not saying always, <laughs> um, like we have a design, a brand has a design, they send it to a production country, they're making a sample and the sample goes back. And it can go up to 10 times. So with all the flies, the fabrics that has been used and it's just a lot of pollution and it's not necessary. It's not need, like it's, it's not needed, right? Um, so with sampling digitally, uh, they illuminate this entire physical sampling process. Because yeah, even the sampling process can be very wasteful. I mean, usually with the high-end design houses, they have extra fabric that they'll sample their garments in because the finished goods need to be done in a very expensive fabric. But there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a waste process for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. And then also, I mean, you and I were even discussing last night too with the rise of e-commerce, the return rates of so many of these e-commerce big players are just so high, it's completely baked into their business model. And why are those return rates so high? I think a lot of it has to do with fit, that things yeah. don't fit properly. And you know, we've all been there when you buy something on the internet and it looks one way on the model and you get it home and it just doesn't look quite the same. Mm -hmm. um, speak to us a little bit about how the fabricant is able to lessen that gap so that people really feel like they're a part of the process and their expectations are managed and they know how they're gonna look and feel if they're wearing it themselves in their yeah. creation. Mm -hmm. So we're not specializing specifically in how that fit is created for an individual. I'm sure companies do that. But how we want to do that is like, if we m create such a high-end fashion couture piece, like normally who would wear that, right? Like mostly a big star or, you know, a very rich person or, uh, you know, like, but it, it's very, you know, like exclusive for a certain public. But because it can be used as filters or photo dressing, like it's becoming more accessible for a way bigger audience. Uh, so now we can also wear a couture piece. So like this, um, this was the, the folk uh, Singapore drop. It was the first NFT cover that folk did. And it was just a big mark point in history, especially for us to be recognized <laughs> as uh, fashion. Um, so when you scan the, the, um, the cover, you get directed to the, um, to the filter and you could immediately also wear this beautiful piece that was made by Romain Gucci. Um, and in a way, we all, all also joke a little bit about, you know, this is even faster fashion. You can immediately wear it with a scan. That's true. But you are still following some more old school creative process principles, like you see the, the idea of the mood board here and collecting references. Talk to me a little bit about that process and the parts of your work that get you maybe away from the screen and, and immersed in the real world as well. Mm -hmm. So to create something, you have to understand the, the fabrics, the feeling. Um, mostly we work actually always in front of our screen. <laughs> but I do think references are very important to understand why, and the storytelling especially behind it, like why has been this um, pieces created and where does it come from specifically, right? So because we did a, a drop for Folk Singapore, we went into deep dive into their, um, to when Singapore was established and what kind of way of, of historical dressing they have because we find like traditional clothing very important because it had so many storytelling behind it and so many craftsmanship, like a mass production basically kind of destroyed that, right? Um, so then uh, a local designer came with this photograph and we were very inspired by that. It's like this beautiful Sunitang, it's called. 
uh, which comes more from Malay culture. Um, and also we work with this uh, digital avatar creator and very known crypto artist, Shavon Wong, who is a local artist in uh, Singapore. Um, so it's basically finding the team, like who, yeah, normally you find a model, but then it's like, who would wear this kind of garment and what is the fit, how, how does it work together, how does it, you know, get into the space. So you're going basically through the same steps, but in a, in a, in a different way, in a digital way. And do individual digital designers have their own specialty or their own craft where, you know, might be their niche or they really excel in, be it beading or draping or any of these traditional fashion principles, do you find? Or does everyone become just an expert in all areas given the <laughs> possibilities of the technology? Yeah. Well, I think everybody has, um, has its own, like, gift, but it's about educating each other about those gifts that we own and treasure. Like fashion designers own a very beautiful craft of, of pattern making and understanding of fabrics and stitches. And while 3D designers know how to set up lighting and um, cinematography and how to make avatars. So it's always about this intertwining of skills, but also educating each other to become generalist in the space. So. We see slowly, the, or slowly, we, we see our fashion designers growing into uh, 3D fashion generalists that are not only specific trained on being uh, a draper or being uh, somebody that makes the patterns, but really knows every step in the process. That's really inspiring. It's so interesting to hear about all these different applications, and I think for everyone here in the audience, you can think about an area of your life or an industry that you work in where it might be beneficial to explore some of this technology or this way of working or removing some of the physical, replacing it with the digital, reducing your waste and kind of unlocking a new realm of your creativity, which is what we see the fabricant doing. So it's such a pleasure to have you here to learn more about it. It's such an interesting topic. So thank you yeah. so much, Suzanne. I'd love to open it up to if anyone has any questions for Suzanne, um, or anything about the fabricant as well. It's a great opportunity. I know it can be a little. Yes. Did you put your hand up or no? I thought she put her hand up, but maybe she was just fixing her hair. Oh, we, we have some questions that were submitted. Okay, perfect. Because nobody likes to ask the first question. I usually plant someone in the audience to ask the first question just to get the ball rolling, but we don't need to do that this time. Okay, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, they're all from Anonymous. Okay, do we need digital clothes since this also leaves somewhat of an environmental footprint? Can mm -hmm. you compare the two in environmental terms? Yes, um, both do leave a carbon footprint and I do think it's also good to think about it. It's a really beautiful question. So. A lot of times when we buy something, it's because of the functionality, right? When I buy a t-shirt, I want to keep warm, I want to cover myself, but there are also t-shirts that are like 500 euro. And then it's like, where does this value try from, right? Is this t-shirt really <clears throat> 500 euro? Or is it something else uh, that creates this value? And do we really need it to exist physically to have this value around, um, around this fashion piece? Um, so I think in there, fashion, uh, digital fashion can tap into, like we don't need to have this like, you know, like high end fashion to exist in real life if we can have it digitally. Yeah, and I mean, obviously the, the environmental footprint would be less when you're Way less. consuming data versus raw materials that and are being human transferred. Human resources as well, yeah. Yes, I mean, even if you think about like a garment that you might be wearing right now, if you think about the journey that it's probably gone on from the raw material being sourced, converted into fabric, manufactured wherever it is made, uh, probably somewhere overseas because they mm -hmm. don't make many things in Iceland in terms of clothing. And then 
distributed to you accordingly, it, it acquires quite a few air miles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also like, we buy also a lot of things. I think everybody has ever been a fashion victim of things, right? Like, we buy things to explore our identity, but what if we don't have to buy it anymore, but we can just try it online and explore our identity there? Uh, Another question is, could you mention what 3D tools are the most popular amongst digital fashion designers? Yes, yeah, so Clothe 3D is um, the fashion, like the, the cloak draping software. Um, it's a really funny story. Uh, actually, it was already there on the market for a while, uh, but it wasn't adopted by the fashion industry. So game industry makes a lot of, made a lot of use of it, and lately it got adopted by the fashion industry. So Clothe 3D is number one if you want to create garments, but there are also coming other softwares into the game like Substance Designer, where you can create uh, tex textu textiles, uh, or Blender, which is a free application where you can model um, basically anything from buttons to jewelry to anything. So I think that those are the three most popular ones. Gamers have never been so fashion forward. They are actually already really far. Yeah. Like when I started with 3D, there wasn't any like fashion content about 3D, uh, but there were a lot of game gamers, uh, like game designers uh, that created garments. So I was basically watching their YouTube videos. And lastly, can you give us the name of the Discord channel? We have some interest there to join. Yes, it's The Fabricant, so you can find it also on our website, thefabricant.com. Uh, there's a link there where you can click on it and you will get directed to the Discord server. Wonderful. Well, Tak Ferea, Suzanne, and all of you, thank you so much. And you can continue the conversation with her after this as well on the Discord. Bye. <laughs>